going to tell you not to do that, but if you did want to into any type of search engine on your phone, <laughs> you would find yourself drowning in a matter of seconds from a, a tsunami of reels, of TikToks, of blogs, of essays, of posts, of rants about the validity of the Bible. You would find people accusing the Bible of promoting slavery, genocide, misogyny, bigotry, and can I go on? Yes, I will. Some people will point out historical or scientific inaccuracies or translation issues. It's exhausting. But no matter what their argument or what particular angle they are advancing, the end goal is always the same, to minimize or completely eradicate the authority that the Bible has in the life of an individual, group, or culture. And every year when we plan our sermon series out, we deliberately choose a topic that directly answers or prompts questions that people are asking in our current society. Something that is actually targeted to a cultural touch point, hot point that is happening right now. And this year we took on the Bible. Fun, right? So what is the Bible? It's role in our lives. And why are we as Christians in this space still reading, trusting, and building our lives on this ancient text that we believe, as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So today, we begin our series by asking the question that all of the other questions stem from, which is what authority does the Bible claim over us? It's the kind of question that depending on the answer changes the course of your life. For example, like when we were in the height of the COVID pandemic and we wanted to go somewhere on an airplane and they asked you if you'd had a sore throat or a headache in the last two weeks. Everyone's had a sore throat and a headache in the last two weeks. Every single human being has had a headache or a sore throat. But you know that if you said yes to that particular question, your life was over, your vacation was ruined, and everything was gonna go away. And so you're like, no, perfect health. Look at me, radiating. I, I mean, this is so funny. A, a week and a half before I got married to Andrew, he got COVID, okay? And we had planned this bougie vacation in the Maldives, and it was predicated on a, a positive test, okay? We had, oh no, a negative test, sorry, whoops. A negative test of COVID, okay? And so it was, one of the most stressful experiences of my life, because I'm reading all these blogs saying it, the dead, like COVID lives up to two months in your nasal cavities and all this stuff. So we like pushed off the honeymoon a week, but we still were so afraid that he would test uh, positive for COVID that he was saline spraying his nose. I mean, we were doing all of the hacks, right? Because we're like, by hook or by crook, we are getting on that plane and we are going on our honeymoon. It was so stressful. And when those results came back, it was like the celebration of the century, right? How you answer that question really impacts your whole life. It did for us with COVID, but how we answer the question of what authority does the Bible have over us is just, and I might say even more important, than that question we were asked. But let's begin by saying what the Bible was not supposed to be. And I think that's important to, to lay out what it's not, okay? The Bible was not meant to be a constitution for government or provide political structures for a plural, I can't say that word, pluralistic society. 
It is not meant to be used as the entire scope of world history, although it does have excellent history in it. It's not meant to be a book on science, although the Bible speaks to many scientific truths that have inspired some of the greatest scientific thinkers in our history of our world. It is not meant to be a collection of fairy tales because the stories that are contained within the Bible have more accuracy and attest to parallel history than any other ancient document in the world. And it's not meant to be a series of morality tales because let's be honest, a lot of people in the Bible did not live lives I would want you guys to live at all, not at all. But it does provide moral guidance for reflecting God's image because God stays constant and faithful through the scriptures. And so many of our issues with the Bible stem from making the Bible fit into these categories. There are some of you and you grew up homeschooled and the Bible was your only textbook. And I'm sorry for that because there were other information that you missed. And I'm sorry. The Bible was never meant to be the only thing that you ever had. For others of you, the Bible was used to referee every argument, every decision. It was how everything was structured in your family or your life or the world. And, and you were not able to use any other tools available to you. And again, I say so sorry for that. Because sometimes uh, we make the Bible be something that it's not supposed to be. In the same way as, you know, with, as a parent, my children expect me to be a whole lot of things that I don't ever sign, I didn't sign up to be. Like an unlimited ATM cash machine for the rest of my life. And they expect that, but that's not what I signed up for, okay? I don't know if they got the memo yet, but I'm trying. There's many things that kids put on their parents that were like, that is not what a parent is supposed to be. I will be the loving faithful, caring person in your life. I will be constantly in your life in these ways, but I am not all of the other things you think I should be. So let's go back to this. What is the purpose of the Bible? The answer is to reveal who God is, what our identity and purpose as human beings is. You see, the Bible reveal was, sorry, I am all over the place this morning. Forgive me. My words and my brain are not connecting. We'll try this again. You see, the Bible reveals the existence of God. Plain and simple. A being who is outside of time and space, who created our world on purpose, for a purpose. He created a world that was good. And then he created humans, male and female, in the image of God to work together giving them responsibility for caring for this good world. That's why in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, this is like the first chapter of the Bible, says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move on the ground, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful in number, fill the earth and subdue it. God not only created this world, but he was present in the good creation. He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve every day. We discover a God that not only created us, but gave us a part of himself, placed his likeness in us, and put us on mission to fall in love, to create life, to build families, and to tend this very good world. He gave us identity as children of God and a vocational purpose for our life that we would tend creation and fill the earth with humans. And we also learned that as creator, he claims authority over all of his creation, including us. Ooh. He claims authority over us. You see, when Adam and Eve chose to become their own authority, trusting themselves 
and rejecting God's authority, all hell breaks loose. Male and female ruling together to care for creation breaks down and women become the ruled. The creation breaks down and instead of working with humanity, it works against humanity. Death enters the created world. The initial sin of rejecting God's authority in favor of worshiping themselves and creation is a rejection of their God-given identity and purpose in the world. And out of that primary sin, and again, I want you to hear me today, the primary sin of humanity was rejecting the authority of God and choosing their own authority and worshiping the created world and themselves instead of worshiping God. Out of that sin, moral sins start to reveal themselves very quickly. Murder, lust, theft, covetousness, and treating fellow human beings who are created in the image of God as slaves. Isn't it interesting that in worshiping themselves and the created earth, human beings got worse, not better. And the only way I can describe that is, I don't know if you've ever done gymnastics. I certainly haven't, um, <laughs> ever. But I have tried, after watching a Nadia Comaneci movie, that inspired me to become a gymnastics person when all of the evidence was pointing to the contrary in my life. I went to a gym one day when I was nine and tried to walk on the balance beam and do her cool moves. And what I found is if I looked ahead at my friend, I could walk on that balance beam quite well. The moment I looked down, because that's what I want to do, I want to look down, I want to look at my feet, I want to look at the beam, I fell off. Bad things. And they're like, you can't look at your feet, you can't look at the beam, you have to look at the person. But that doesn't make sense. Also, when you're climbing a tree, you look up, you don't look around, you don't look down. Weird things happen. And, and in that simplistic illustration, that's what humanity did to God. God's like, look at me and everything else will make sense. You will be able to walk on the balance beam. Look at me. But no, we were like, no, no, I think I'd rather look at the beam and look at my own feet because that feels better. Oh, it's not better, friends. And I still have probably some injuries, latent injuries from my two weeks of trying to be Nadia Comaneci with my friends. Whew. But the Bible is a faithful witness to the unfailing love of God for his creation and his never-ending pursuit to call his people back to their original design and purpose. Through the faith of Abraham. Why is Abraham such a big deal? Let me tell you. Abraham is a big deal in the Bible because he did what Adam and Eve didn't do. He trusted God. And that's why the Bible makes such a big deal about an Abraham trusted God. He started to reverse the cycle instantly in his life. He's like, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to, in faith, look at him and not look at my situation. So through the faith of Abraham who trusted in the Lord, we are reminded that our original identity and vocational purpose in the world was still there, buried under the hot mess of sin and death. In Genesis 12, 1 to 3, it says this. Then the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Again, going back to the original design. Trust me. And when you trust me and you become my child, then you will put back on mission to bless the world. But this is, has to happen first. You have to trust me first. God never gives up on his creation and their intended purpose. Isn't that great? 
Like, I feel like, you know, in my life, there was things I maybe could have done, you know. My parents like to remind me that I was smart enough to go to law school, you know. I gave up on that. I did. Moved on from that. Moved on from a degree, even. Um, moved on from all the things that they would tell me. And, and they loved me and they believed the best of me. And, but then life happened and I went on a different path. But this is really cool. God never gives up. He's just like, I made you this way and I'm just going to keep reminding you we're not going to plan B. We're going to keep going back to your original design. And the scripture tells the story of very imperfect people. I'm going to say downright despicable people who are in covenant with God and despite all of their wrong choices, manage to keep returning to their creator long enough to usher in Jesus, <laughs> the son of God, the perfect image of the father in human born. And we see the second Adam show up on the earth. And as testified in all of the four Gospels that we have that signal the start of the New Testament, Jesus came to earth as a human to show us what our true identity as humans are and what it practically looks like to discover our true vocation, our true purpose as men and women. You track him with me so far? You see, Jesus taught us that we are the children of God and that we can have relationship with our Father who is in heaven. And out of that knowing, our lives are set on a different path. That in discovering and living the truth that we are children of God, it shifts and changes our vocational identity. Let's think about Simon and Andrew. They're no longer fishing for fish, right? He calls them to fish for men. That's why after Jesus dies, they go back to their old ways and he's like, no. Once and for all, you are not fishermen anymore. You're called differently. Let's think of Mary Magdalene. No longer identified as the woman with seven demons, but now an apostle to the apostles the first witness to the resurrected Jesus. Let's think of Mary, Martha's sister, no longer in her sister's shadow, sitting with Jesus at his feet, taking the place of the most favored disciple. And Jesus said he would not take it from her because she was finally living into her true vocation and purpose as a child of God with access to everything that the Father had for her. That's why in John 13, 1 through 5, Jesus takes, oh, sorry, John takes great pains in describing how Jesus knew who he was. I want you to open your Bibles here. I know we're bouncing around a lot, so I tried to put as much as I could on the screen, but this is an open your Bible passage. John chapter 13, 1 through 5. This one matters. You can... Pull it up on your phone, if you have the Bible app on your phone. If not, we do have paper Bibles tucked in to the seats in the pockets. Every two or three pocket in front of you, you can read along too. But this is important. Okay, John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them until the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and he had come from God and was returning to God. So, he, took, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I want you to pay attention to how many times in this tiny little passage of Scripture it says that Jesus knew. He knew who he was. 
He knew who his father was and he knew that his time was fulfilled. He knew what to do. He knew he was the Messiah, God's son. He knew that his job was to reconcile mankind back to the father. And how did he know that? Through the scriptures. He had the Old Testament and he had the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we forget that Jesus was fully human. Jesus quoted scripture more than anything, anyone else alive, scripture matters. And the scriptures testified to him. John chapter five, verse 39 to 40 says this, this is Jesus speaking. You study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life, but they're the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You see, there will be a lot of people that want to put their faith in scripture, just the words. But if you are placing all your emphasis on the words and not placing your faith in Jesus who is the fulfillment of all the words of the Old Testament, you're missing the point. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus is the lens by which we read the scriptures. It is Jesus. And when Jesus in his humanity chose to stand in his identity as God's son and in his vocation, as Messiah who will reconcile the world back to the Father, undoing the curse of the fall, the veil in the temple was torn. And God could once again walk with his creation as their Father, and the world began to heal. And when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, we see humans transformed from fearful followers to confident witnesses of the resurrection set on mission to reconcile all people to their true identity as a child of God, created on purpose for a purpose, irregardless of race, gender, social status, sexuality, whether they were slave or free. And as the Old Testament develops, I mean, as the New Testament develops, we get a peek, like we just get to look a little bit into the new creation the Holy Spirit filling men and women, young and old, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, calling them back to their original design as the children of God, living in communion with him, filled with the same spirit that hovered over the unformed world, my friends, that held back the seas for the Israelites to pass through, the same spirit that fell on the prophets, the priests, and the kings in the Old Testament, the same spirit that alighted on Jesus as a dove at his baptism and raised him from the grave. This same spirit falls on the believers in Pentecost not only re-establishing their new identity, he's like, your new identity is your old identity. It's your original one, not the sinful one. It's the original one. You are beloved sons and daughters and you are created on purpose for a purpose. And your job is the same as the job of Jesus. You are called to redeem and reconcile a broken world back to God. Romans 8, 11 says this, if the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit that lives in you. My friends, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. We forget that. 2 Corinthians 5 14 verse 21, you can go there in your scriptures, in your Bibles. Let's read this again. Oh, this is good stuff, guys. We're just setting the stage for the rest of the series, but we're going to set it well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 14. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live to themselves, 
but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, listen, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And now he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Guys, this is the authority that the Bible claims over us. This is it. This is who we are. And why is this good news? Question, right? Why does the fact that our creator God claim authority over us, over all of creation, why is that good news? Because I think for a lot of people that sounds like bad news, right? They don't want to give authority of their lives over to someone else over to a being that is outside of this world. What does that, why is that good news? To answer that today, I believe is because the biblical account of identity and purpose in vocation are still the two main questions that every human being asks no matter what time, space, culture, place they're born in. Who am I and why am I here? Who am I and why am I here? Let's look at who am I. Who am I? Depending on the culture, time and place people are born into, this question is answered differently. In our time right now, people are looking for identity in so many areas their political beliefs, the color of their skin, the culture they come from, who they are attracted to, what they do with their bodies or to their bodies. And all of these alternative identity markers will ultimately fail them because we were created to find our identity in relationship to our creator God. This is the identity that will never fail them. This is the truth that lessens the hold that all of the other identity markers have that try and lay claim on the souls of the people we love. This truth doesn't eradicate all of our other identity markers. Like I'm still white, I am. I'm still a mother, I'm still married, and they're things, they're part of my identity, but it is rooted in the identity first that I am the daughter of the Most High God. That is the ultimate identity. Every other identity is secondary to the identity that I am the daughter of the Most High King. And to the question, why am I here? Again, it depends where or where you were born. Some people will say you were born to work off bad karma, or you're an accident of the universe, a mistake, the continuation of a legacy, maybe. Maybe you were born to be great. Maybe you were born to help your family bring in more money, and the more kids they had, the more you could work on the farm. Maybe you were brought into the world to repair a broken marriage. Let me tell you, don't ever do that. Hey, our marriage is terrible. Let's have another kid. That'll make it all better. We're giggling because some of us have already done that sometimes, but that's okay. 
And so this grace for us all, there's grace. But it's not a great thing to put on a child. You will fix my marriage. Why? We don't know why you are here. The crazy thing is you didn't get a choice in the matter. But the Bible tells you that across time and space, irregardless of for where or what reason you were born and brought into the world by your family, your parents, good reasons, bad reasons, horrific reasons, accidental reasons, that you have an identity that's bigger than that. You have a purpose that's bigger than that. You are called by God to partner with the Holy Spirit in the work of reconciling the world back to God, to representing God to his creation by bearing his image by redeeming and restoring what sin and death has done in our world and by living a life where we worship God and not ourselves, where we worship God and not trees and plants and moons and stars, where we lift our eyes higher like the balance beam and we look at God and we pivot when needed because God goes with us instead of me doing this, which doesn't work very well. You see, every other vocation in humanity pits itself against itself, competing to be the best, trying to be the most significant, trying to earn the most. But the Bible tells us the opposite. The Bible tells us that what we do is secondary to who we are becoming. In Ephesians 4, which we don't have time to read, we see Paul encouraging the church at Ephesus to reorient their lives around who Jesus says they are. In verse 28, I just want to highlight if Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work to do something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. That's the long and the short of the way that the Lord is, sees your uh, earthly vocation, my friends, other than redeeming and reconciling the world. Do something with your hands. Do something that's going to make money. Why? Oh, so that you will have something to share with those in need. The Bible does not place any emphasis on your career as being your identity. You can do many things, and that's wonderful, because, like, big deal, who cares? Do you have something to give away to others and provide for your family? Great thing, go do that. And then get on with the real job of redeeming and reconciling humanity. Go do that. Go love people. Go serve people. Go care for people. However you make your money, bless that. That's cool, just as long as you don't hoard it for yourself. Give it away. Other than that, he's not worried that you didn't become the doctor you thought you were going to be or become the high-flying lawyer or do all the things. God's like, no, I've already given you a purpose. I've already given you an identity. Go do it. I've given you every tool that you need. However you make the money and your bread, bless that. Just don't steal. Cool. I mean, I feel like that's a low bar. Can you imagine if your parents sat you down and said, no, son and daughter, uh, you know, we want you to be successful in your life, so don't steal. Make honest money. That's it? You don't care whether I go to college or not? You don't care whether I get a doctorate or not? No, no, just don't steal. And make sure you're generous. Whatever money you earn, make sure you have enough to feed other people and to give it away. Can you imagine how wonderful it would be to feel that lack of pressure? Oh. What we're really asking you to do is to care for people, to love people, to serve God, to worship Him. To go to church, to care for others, invite, always have another spare seat at your table to invite more people in, pray for them, care for them, look for the broken hearted. Oh, I think I can breathe a little easier already because our earthly vocation is just a tool for us to receive honest pay for honest work. Some of you get to actually get paid for something that is in line with your vocational calling to redeem and reconcile the earth. And if that is you, congratulations. That's great. But most of us, that isn't, that isn't real. Like even like, like anyone on staff, you'd be like, oh man, they get paid to do the Lord's work. Yeah, I just want you to know that a toilet exploded last week in our church. 
and we found human feces outside that had to be cleaned up. And many other things happen. The Lord's work does not look the way that you think the Lord's work looks. The Lord's work, indeed. <laughs> and that's okay. At least we didn't steal the toilet. It's okay. To close this sermon, I want to tell you a story of one woman. I heard, I was first made aware of her um, by the Lectio 365 app. I will continue to promote that as long as I live. It's a daily devotional. It's 15 minutes, and it's the best 15 minutes of your day. And I'm a pastor, and I still sometimes don't want to do it. But then I do it, and then I'm like, so glad I did. But I learned about a woman called Pandita Ramabai. And I'm going to read you her little story. Ramabai was born in India in 1858. Her father was a dedicated Hindu who defied the conventions of his time by teaching his daughter to read Sanskrit. The family lived as pilgrims, teaching Sanskrit manuscripts in public places so people could hear stories of the gods. Tragically, when famine struck India in 1876, she was 18 years old, Ramabai lost her father, mother, and sister to starvation. She and her brother continued their lives as pilgrims, but Ramabai became increasingly dissatisfied with what she read in the Hindu scriptures and the, equality, the inequality that she saw between castes and between men and women in her society. At 20 years old, she became the first Indian woman to be granted the title Pandita, which means learned master, in recognition of her ability as a Sanskrit scholar. And at 22 years old, she married and discovered a Bengali translation of the Gospel of Luke. She started to read it. She traveled to England in hopes of becoming a doctor, but that door was closed to her. They were not educating women in that field at that time. But she did, however, have the opportunity to learn about the Christian faith, and she was deeply impacted by the work of the Sisters of the Cross, who cared for fallen women. She had never seen such kindness extended to women in a similar situation in India. They were beaten down, they were discarded, they were thrown away. Moved by a faith that gives hope to the most vulnerable, and a saviour that lifts up the downtrodden, she decided to get baptised. In her autobiography, she writes, One thing I knew by this time, I needed Christ, and not merely his religion. This is important, my friends. The Bible says that God does not wait for me to merit his love, but heaps it upon me without my deserving it. It also says that there's neither male or female in Christ. How good, how indescribably good. What good news it is for me, a woman, born in India among Brahmins. Brahmins are the top level caste and she was at the low level. Poverty. They do not hold out hope for me or the like of me. But the Bible declares that Christ did not reserve this great salvation for a particular caste or sex. She traveled from England to the USA over the following years, learning all she could about Jesus and the Bible, but her thoughts and prayers returned to India. She wrote, I questioned in my mind over and over again why some missionaries did not come forward to found faith missions in India. And then the Lord said to me, why don't you begin to do this yourself instead of wishing for others to do it? And so she returned to India and founded Mukti Mission, trusting God for all that she needed. The Pandita Ramabai Mukti Mission is still in operation, running for more than 130 years, providing education, safe homes, and dignity to women and children, regardless of their caste, creed, religion, or status. You see, her encounter with the Bible set her on a course that reoriented her identity from a poor Hindu scholar to a beloved daughter of the King of Kings who doesn't exclude and doesn't discriminate. 
and out of this new identity, because that had to be settled first, right? Out of that new identity, she finds herself stirred to share this truth with others, to be a part of the redeeming and the reconciling of her own people. And this is the authority of Scripture in action, my friends. You see, this story is bigger than a governance structure or a cherry-picked bully pulpit. It's bigger than using it just to teach science or history or as moral fables to make us make better choices. Although all of those things can be used, that's fine because it's God-breathed and it's wonderful. But to reduce it to that is to rob it from its actual purpose. Most of the times, we turn the Bible into something it was never meant to be. And then we get mad when we're disappointed that it doesn't fulfill what we want it to be. Many of you grew up in America where the Bible was used to advance a political agenda or as the primary document for your education or to sell you things. That's not its purpose. Its purpose to tell you who God is, to tell you you are under his authority and to tell you who your calling and purpose and vocation is in the world. That, my friends, will preach forever and ever and ever. Sometimes when we try and make the Bible fit every situation, we have missed the forest for the trees. Hear me today. The Bible is not a prescription, it is a revelation. It is not a prescription, it is a revelation. And what it reveals changes everything. I want you to close your eyes right now. I want you to get comfortable just sitting in here today. Again, you got a lot of information. A lot of information, a lot of things to think about, but I just want you to close your eyes and ask yourself this question. What would change about my life? What would change about the way I see myself? If I actually believed that I'm your child and that you have a plan and a purpose for me that is good. What would change? What would change in your everyday life? Would you hold earthly things a little looser? <laughs> Would maybe you stop striving so much? Maybe you wouldn't have to explain yourself over and over and over again because you always feel misunderstood, you always feel judged. How would it change if you really believed that the creator of the universe calls you your child? And that your purpose on this earth is not linked to a certain career or job, but it is so much deeper than that. Your purpose is to be the image of God in the world and point people back to Him. To get your hands dirty in the muck. I'm going to tell you this one thing as you've got your eyes closed. Some of you are sitting in here today and you're like, but I don't know like, what my true vocation in the Lord is. I'm going to tell you, what do you get annoyed about that isn't happening in the world? What's something that you see and you're like, somebody should do something to fix that injustice or fix that wrong or do that. Somebody should do that. 
Whatever makes you think somebody should do that, that's, that shouldn't be right. There shouldn't be people hungry or there shouldn't be people living on the streets. Or there shouldn't be people being persecuted or judged. There shouldn't be people being discriminated against. There shouldn't be fill in the blank. My friends, I think you're getting close to your vocation, your vocation from the Lord. Because that's the heart of God beating through your human body. With every eye closed in here, if you are in this room and you know that you have not locked in your identity as the beloved child of God, you don't have confidence in that today. You do not have confidence that, that, that God loves you. Maybe you know that like you might have to earn, you might feel like I have to do the right thing. I have to earn stuff. I need to do these things. I need to prove to God that I'm worthy. That is not the gospel. The gospel says that we are loved no matter, in spite of how we present ourselves, how we show up, we are loved. And if you're in here today and you're like, Mel, as you're talking about being the beloved child of God, this is something I really struggle with and I need help. I just want you to put your hand up and say, that's me. And we're going to pray for you right now. I see your hand. Thank you for having courage. Yep, I see your hand too. Don't be afraid. Yep, this God is meeting you today. Yeah, I see your hand. I do. And he wants to come and tell you and show you those things. So we're going to pray with our friends that are raised their hands right now. Because here we pray together. We're a family. So I want you to repeat after me. Father God, I want to believe. Help me in my unbelief. I want to be your child. I want to believe that you love me. So today, I receive it. I take you at your word. Fill me with your love. I receive your forgiveness. And I repent of my wrong. Fill me with your spirit. I choose today to be called a child of God. No matter what my brain says, no matter what culture says, I choose you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to take communion today. And here at Life, we take communion communally. And so... Thank you so much. I'm just going to give you a little demonstration. We have two places in the front and one place at the back where you can come forward for communion. Um, we have a juice in a cup and we have crackers for you to dip in. We ask you not to drink the juice out of the cup, out of respect for everyone else. Um, and if you are immunocompromised or gluten-free, we do have little individual portions for you as well. But we're going to pray together and then we're going to take communion as a family. Oh, Lord, on the night that you were betrayed, you took bread, you broke it, you gave it to your disciples. And you told us to take and eat your body broken for us, Lord. And we receive that. Lord, we receive the cup that you tell us is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we receive your broken body and your cup of forgiveness. We allow that and we take that into our own physical bodies today. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can come and take communion here as we line up.
As you come back to your seat, remain standing. Prayer team, if you have already taken communion and would love to come forward, uh, we would love to have you be down the front for prayer. Here at Life Vineyard Church, we believe in the power of prayer for healing, to set free the captives, to proclaim liberty and justice for all. <laughs> and this is the gift of our lives, right? He sets us free. Jesus sets us free. If you are in here especially, if there's something stirring in you with regard to vocation, like God's calling and purpose on your life, maybe you have thought that it was always going to be connected to your job that you do. And the Lord's just given you a little bit of a, a different perspective on that this morning. Please come forward. We'd love to pray for you. But if you have pain in your body, pain in your soul, and you're ready to have someone pray for you, we would love to pray for you. So the front is open. Prayer team are here. But for everyone else, we're just going to pray a blessing here and send you out. I'm going to ask you right now to lift your hands. And we're just going to speak to the Lord right now. Lord, we declare over these people today that they are the redeemed of the Lord. That you have chosen them on purpose for a purpose. That their life matters. That you are their father. And that they're not an accident. Lord, we speak over every single person right now that they would receive the blessing of God, that they would receive the truth, that it would fill them, that it would transform them, and it would change their life to be able to change the world. Lord, we pray your blessing over every single person in this space. May it fill them. May it make them whole. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Church, thank you for coming to church today. Again, prayer team down the front. Do not waste this opportunity to receive prayer. Thank you so much for coming to church.